Today I'm hosting a debate between author and journalist Glenn Greenwald versus live streamer and political commentator Destiny. We're going to be debating about whether January 6th was an insurrection and Trump's role in it. So let's get started and lay some ground, uh, some ground for the rest of the debate. Was what happened on January 6th an insurrection? And can, within your answer, can you define what an insurrection is? Glenn, can you start and then we'll go to Destiny. Yeah, I'm really glad that we started there because I do feel like we spent in that last debate a lot of time on the question of whether this was a coup or whether this was an insurrection. And I feel like these are more political terms of art than terms of science that have a concrete definition, which is one of the reasons why I think it's not only justifiable but actually necessary to look at how these terms have been applied historically and in other contexts, not as a way of distracting from January 6th, but precisely to see whether or not the attempt to apply those terms to January 6th is consistent with how these terms are generally used or whether it's just kind of a partisan attempt to create a narrative that serves the Democratic Party. So for me, I guess you kind of have to look at coup and insurrection a little bit differently. A coup is when some faction in society, either the faction that is already in power or the faction that is not in power but wants to be in power, mount some very credible and serious attempt, almost always using force or the threat of force, people who are a militia or the actual military, in order to seize power illegitimately outside of the legal structure using uh, violence or the threat of violence in order to do so. An insurrection just simply, I think, implies that there's a faction domestically that has launched a serious rebellion, a serious attempt to seize power in that country, again, using extrajudicial, extra-legal means that in almost all cases, involves either the use of force or the threat of force. You may be able to imagine a situation where the use of force or the threat of force uh, is not necessary for an insurrection, but I think it's extremely difficult to imagine such a case. But in general, that's how the terms are used. And then you have these kind of subsidiary terms that are very new that are kind of retreats from those terms like legislative coup or soft coup that, as I said, is a way to kind of put it into the general category of coup and insurrection without actually calling it one. And that typically involves the illegitimate use of a legal process or some other means that's still extrajudicial, contrary to the law, without actually using force or the threat of force to achieve those ends. Well, what about faking votes? What about what? What about faking votes? Would that be counted? I'm sorry. If you try to fake votes, would that be counted as an insurrection or you took it just force, really? Fake to fake votes? Yeah. I mean, if you were to try and steal an election using fraud, I don't really think that's the sort of thing that we have in the past described as either an insurrection or a coup. That's just more stealing an election. And that's why I think it's so important to distinguish between actually when force is actually involved or invoked or the threat of violence is invoked precisely because there are so many other ways to seize power illegitimately that fall short of being a coup or insurrection. That's actually a good example of one, which would be fabricating votes or throwing away valid votes or fabricating invalid votes as a means of winning an election illegitimately. Uh, Destiny, what's, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, I'm happy to almost run with uh, Glenn's definition here because I think January 6th pretty squarely and easily falls within that. But I guess the two definitions I would offer up are uh, the Colorado Supreme Court. They concluded that an insurrection, as used in Section 3, is one, a public use of force or a threat of force, two, by a group of people, and three, in order to hinder or prevent the execution of the Constitution of the United States. Um, in Paulson and Baud's paper, they go over broader definitions, but they more or less say the same thing in more words. Um, I mean, we can read from them, and they would say that insurrection is best understood as concerted, forcible resistance to the authority of government to execute the laws in at least some significant respect. So I would say that like an insurrection is probably more than being upset at a police officer and saying like, no, I'm not going to you know, get a ticket and running away. Um, probably has to involve a group of people who are making a concerted effort to like resist the good faith execution of law from the federal government in this case. Uh, and I think January 6th with uh, Trump's plan to circumvent the electoral process with false electors, um, the actual day of events where Trump gives a huge speech, he sends a whole bunch of people down to the Capitol, uh, ostensibly to protest the certification of the vote, where the people at the Capitol engage in violence uh, in order to prevent Congress from certifying the vote. 
And then when the people at the Capitol engaged in violence, succeeded in preventing the certification of the vote for some number of hours, and then were finally cleared away, I would say that whatever we call an insurrection or whatever definition we use, all of the events here are bullseye like an insurrection. So can I ask a question to you? I don't want to usurp your role. I don't know how you want to conduct it, but if you don't yeah, mind, you want. I'd like to just ask kind of follow-up question to that. Mm-hmm. The question I have for you then, Destiny, is is there any requirement that it actually poses a credible or a serious threat to succeed in its aim? So, for example, let's imagine that Donald Trump wins the election in November, as most polls predict that he will, at least as of now. And let's say that You have one or two people inside the U.S. government who are kind of career civil servants who view Trump as such a great threat to all things decent in the United States. And they go to the Capitol and they're armed with knives and they stand outside and they say, we have knives and we demand that Donald Trump be removed from the White House and the Congress vote to impeach him immediately and reinstall Joe Biden because we think he's the legitimate president. With that in the history books is something that you would then call a coup or an attempted coup or an insurrection? Um, I mean, you might call it one, but I think it would be so minor um, and it would be so silly that I don't know if we would necessarily refer to it as such. Uh, for instance, like we could we could concoct a conspiracy to murder thing where I make a plan that's so ridiculous with another person that we're going to go and buy, you know, I guess, snow and we're going to pour it down somebody's roof until it all melts and the person drowns and dies. I'm like, maybe it, and we actually go and buy the stuff and we go to the house and take steps towards the crime, but it's such a silly crime. I don't know if you'd call it that. Um, I'm sure we could find cases like really far away on the peripheral on the edge. But with January 6th, I think we're, again, I think we're in a bullseye definition of whatever we would call insurrection or attempted coup or rebellion. So I think the reason why I ask that is, I mean, I think actually the extent of the threat, like the credibility or the gravity of the threat is absolutely critical to whether or not in any other instance we would be calling something like this a coup or an attempted coup. Because if you look at January 6th, although you did have more than two people doing the sort of thing that I just described, and I asked a ridiculous example to try and understand whether you would at least concede that it requires some kind of significant or quantitatively impressive attempt to actually seize control from the legal means of of power. What you had on uh, on January 6th is a hodgepodge of people, which, according to the federal government itself, had only a minority, a small minority of people who actually used violence of any kind. There's only something like 10 percent or 8 percent, depending on how you counted the number of people charged who are even accused of having used violence at all. And it's a pretty broad definition for using violence, like anyone who got near any attempt to hit a police officer or to push a police officer aside got put in that violent category. So I met a very small small number of people. And then on top of that, not a single person during this entire three-hour riot actually pulled out an arm, let alone discharged an arm. The only arm that was discharged was one that was used against the people who were protesting. And then it basically got subdued in three hours, not with any kind of real force, Pretty easily. I mean, it was pretty easily subdued in a very short period of time. And I don't think anybody would argue, and I'm interested in whether you would, that this ever got near a serious threat to remove or topple the most powerful and militarized government ever to exist on the planet. I mean, do you think it even got close to a serious threat to do that? Um, so just, just as a quick thing, going through all of these points, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that's used to talk about January 6th that I feel like doesn't want to engage with the facts of what happened. And most of these points are just not relevant. So hodgepodge of people, um, it was a collection of Donald Trump supporters that had been called there weeks or months in advance by Donald Trump. All of these people showed up to his ellipse speech. Uh, A lot of them did. All of them marched to the Capitol, all chanting the same things with the clear goal of protesting the certification of the vote. That's why they were saying things like 1776, which we all recognized was a rebellion against Great Britain. Um, like Like it wasn't a hodgepodge of people. It was a collection of people that were all there for an incredibly specific purpose. I think it would be unbelievable for me for to ever accept the idea that it just randomly happened that those people happened to be gathered, that were all supporting the same candidate, that was saying that Congress shouldn't certify the vote, that was trying to get Pence not to certify the vote, that these people happened to go down to the Capitol, they happened to engage in violence, they happened to succeed in delaying the certification of the vote, 
all of this happened randomly from a hodgepodge of people that were subdued in three hours, whether they were subdued, whether they discharged an arm. Um, and to say that they weren't a serious threat is also crazy, given that there were times where these people were literally rooms away from other lawmakers. Um, I think it's more incredible to say that it never was a serious threat. Like you yourself say that only a small percentage engaged in violence. What if that percentage instead of 10 percent was 15 percent? What if instead of 15, it was 20 or 25 percent? Who's to say what could have possibly happened afterwards, uh, other than the fact that thankfully, retrospectively, we can look and see that it didn't get to that. But I mean, this was some tens of thousands of people that were many engaged in violent protests that were breaking into the Capitol and Wait, managed to delay the certification. Were, how, how many people are you seeing were at the Capitol? Capitol on January 6th? Um, I don't know. I've seen everything from 100,000 plus to some people say it was 50 to 70,000. I don't know what the exact who number is. the Capitol? Was, no, no, not who, who entered, entered, who were there protesting outside. Oh, how many entered? How many entered? Um, was it, I, the numbers I saw were anywhere from one to 2,000? Right, okay. Yeah. So, so imagine if 5,000 so, would have entered or 10,000, right? Who's to say that there couldn't it, have been? Yeah, so right. just on, yeah. put, putting on this, Destiny's point, at, Glenn, at what point would you call that an insurrection? Or what, at what point would you say, you said 6, 7%. Well, violent, is there a certain percentage that needs to hit? Or was, Well, I mean, you... Destiny himself acknowledged in the very first question I asked him that you, there's a quantitative component to this for sure, which is why nobody would seriously call two people with knives gathering outside the Capitol. Even though they're proclaiming an insurrectionary intention or objective, nobody would say in history that that would be referred to as the United States having survived a coup or a coup attempt or an insurrection because it was just far too insignificant. And I don't think that there is a, like, as I said, I don't think it's a term of science, these terms like insurrection and coup. I think there are like a lot of the terms that we use in our political vernacular, like terrorism and hate speech or disinformation that really has no fixed meaning. It all kind of depends on who gets to apply the term and for what purpose is a group using violence, a revolutionary group fighting against corru corruption. Are they trying to topple the government and therefore are terrorists? All these terms are very kind of shifting because they're points of propaganda. But what I think is that in order to make a serious case that this is a historic event, I mean, I think one of the Krasenstein brothers began by comparing it to Pearl Harbor or 9-11 and the Civil War, kind of invoking those kinds of events. Democrats have done that as well. I don't hold destiny to that, but clearly there's a belief, I think, that this is like a major event in United States history. And for me, the reason it, it wasn't is because it never did get anywhere near the number that would be required to pose a significant threat to the power of the United States government. And, and that I, number that I, don't, I mean, I, I don't think you can set a quantitative number. You can ask whether and, and I think the kind of people who were there is so important. And that I mean, he uh, Destiny dismissed the idea that it was a hodgepodge trying to say they were all homogenized. Even the U.S. government admits they were wildly disparate people, both in terms of why they were there and what they intended. That's why a few of them got charged with sedition, and then others got charged with misdemeanors, and then some people got charged with felonies, even though they weren't accused of violence, because they had extraordinarily different intentions. This was not, for example, like, I think you can look at a event that kind of comes closer to what would be required to call it a coup, which was the rebellion by the Wagner Group uh, in Russia, where you're talking about an extremely well-trained militia, a well-armed militia of 25,000 soldiers that had the capability to shoot Russian military aircraft from the sky, and they did. They took down six helicopters and a, and a, and a military jet. But even there, the Russian state, nowhere near as powerful as the U.S. state, distracted by the war in Afghanistan, crushed it in 12 hours, like in the court, in the context of Russian history, that is not even like a footnote in terms of like a real threat to the power of the Russian state. And yet that at least had real numbers, 25,000 who were real soldiers. Most of the people who are at this Trump rally, remember the four who died on January 6th, two of them died of a heart attack. One died of a speed overdose. These are people who are not even fit, let alone well-trained soldiers, at least the majority of them. And so when you're talking Just about people a, who really this, did anything this, like that, you're talking about a very small number. Yeah, so I, th there's... Again, I, I find this is, I feel like it's going to be a theme here. The, the obfuscation and then the misdirection on everything, I just don't think any of this is relevant. Nobody thought that the Whiskey Rebellion or the Whiskey Insurrection was going to destroy the entire U.S. government, right? It's a few hundred farmers that were upset over, you know, taxes and alcohol. But like, why do we think that the, the insurrection of the rebellion needs a, a significant chance to succeed 
in order to be called an insurrection or or, or a rebellion. That's just historically, you keep saying historically, 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 that's never been the case. It's never been the case that we've had to establish that it would have never been the case, for instance, if only one state seceded uh, and they had no realistic chance of winning in the Civil War that we would say, oh, well, they weren't insurrectionists or rebellionists because they were never going to win. Um, so on that ground of like they have to have a realistic shot at winning, that's I just don't think that that's just not grounds ever for an insurrection um, or, or to declare some insurrection or rebellion. It's just a way to minimize the events that actually happened because they happened to not be successful. Um, when we talk about because how, if, it, um, if it's a what, joke, then it, if it's a joke, it should be treated as such. But not it, but treated it, as if like it was a joke, historic event. It was a historic that had event. Threatened the United States government. It did threaten the U.S. government. It was a historic event. What other time in U.S. history has the certification of the vote been delayed? The certification. We've had so many official proceedings of Congress, including things like confirming Supreme Court justices, delayed because people went to Capitol Hill, entered Capitol Hill, occupied Capitol Hill, and protested the proceedings mm -hmm. and ended up delaying the proceedings. There have been proceedings to vote on wars where yep. anti-war protesters have disrupted. So all the time we've had people entering the Capitol, protesting congressional mm -hmm. proceedings, and never are the ones who don't use violence accused of felonies, let alone anything resembling the kinds of charges that the January 6th defendants face, because the ideology, the ideological component here is what made this to be something no, so much bigger than so, in super, fact what it was. I'm going to ask I'm going to ask the same question again. When in the history of the United <clears throat> States has the certification of the electoral vote, the peaceful transfer of power from one president to the next been delayed by protesters or violent protesters? There, I, I'm happy to concede that this is the first okay. time that people went on January. Then it's historical. 6th then and it's historical. Interrupted the proceeding. Yeah. I mean, then it's historical, it, right? By no, definition, no, it's a it, moment in history that is unique. It wasn't a. It wasn't a serious disruption. There was they delayed never, the vote, it, didn't they? By three hours or by four hours. Not for the by first week, time in months. U.S. history. Yes, that's significant. The, that's serious. Why? Why is it more significant? to delay this proceeding than other congressional proceedings. Things like voting on wars or confirming Supreme Court justices are pretty serious, too, in terms of the things Congress <laughs> is supposed to do under Article 1. But the reason we don't consider those protests, even though they might have delayed the proceedings some, to be historic or serious or an insurrection, is because they never posed a threat to the stability of the United States government. In order to have an actual insurrection of the kind that you want to claim this is, you would need enormous numbers of very well-trained people who are heavily armed with serious plans to go into the Capitol and overthrow the power of the United States government. This is the kind of drama queen behavior that has dominated what? the Trump so, years where every, every kind yeah. of event is catastrophized to its highest extent. So, so, you then, so you would say that any past, so like the Whiskey Rebellion in the United States... That's that's stupid. They shouldn't have called it that. They should have called it like the farmer protest or something different. Or because even, what no, you're I saying mean, right now it stands in contrast to how every other person viewed insurrectionism or insurrectionists at the time when, say, the Fourteenth Amendment was drafted and ratified. People viewed people sometimes as being insurrectionary or uh, giving aid or comfort to enemies of the United States just for letting their children go off to war to serve the Confederacy. It's nice if you, Glenn Greenwald, personally have some view of what you personally think and insurrectionist or rebellion might look like or what it should be. But to be quite frank, your opinion doesn't really matter. The opinion would be the historical relevance of the saying in the United States. It would be the historical analysis that exists for, for historical rebellions or insurrections in the United States, which oftentimes had very little to no chance of succeeding. Even the insurrectionists themselves thought that they were going to succeed. Um, and, and we would use that analysis that exists at the time when, say, the 14th Amendment was ratified. And then we would use that going forward to figure out what do we think an insurrection and a rebellion is. And again, you can try to minimize and you can try to call it ideological and whatever you want. None of those congressional protests that you mentioned in the past rose to a level where tens of thousands of protesters were violently breaking into Congress and delaying the certification of the presidential is, you, you vote. Just got done, you just got done saying that the maximum number of people who entered the Capitol was 2,000. And now you're calling it tens of thousands of people because you know so well. In fact, you conceded in the very first question I asked you that, of course, there has to be a quantitative component in terms of the gravity of the threat in order to seriously call it an insurrection or a coup, which is why I began by asking you whether or not if two people armed with knives went to the Congress and demanded that Donald Trump be removed after he was declared the winner and threatened to use violence with their knives, whether that would in the history books or by our major newspapers be referred to as the United 
United States fighting off, fighting off a coup or an insurrection. And you said, yeah, I mean, I guess if it's just two people, then it would probably be pretty ridiculous to call it that. So I see this, what happened on January 6th, a three-hour riot that even the FBI's informants on the ground told the FBI in real time was never intended to be any kind of premeditated violent act on the part of most people, but instead was something that happened spontaneously, as so often happens, where political protests confront the police and become violent. I see it much more akin to the kind of ridiculous example that I began by asking you, where you conceded that wouldn't be called an insurrection, than I do some kind of civil war type situation or even a meaningful armed rebellion of the kind that happened in Russia last year, where even that was crushed in 12 hours. Are you, are, like you ever, this... are you familiar with Loki's wager? <coughs> Explain it to me. So, so uh, I think Loki makes a wager with two dwarves or whatever, whatever and eventually they say that they can cut his head off. Um, it comes to the point to where he loses the wager, he, they go to collect their bet, and when they're trying to figure out how to cut his head off, they're arguing over what part of the neck is when the head starts, and then the rest of the neck begins, basically. And the argument he eventually makes is, well, you can't take even a, a centimeter, an inch of my neck, therefore you're not allowed to cut my head off. You're trying to argue right now that because I might not consider two people an insurrection, that I can't possibly consider 2,000 people an insurrection? That's the same as you saying, since I can't tell precisely where your head ends and your neck begins, I might say that your toe is part of your head. This argument is nonsense, and the only way that you can make the argument is to continue to try to make comparisons to other more extreme extreme coups are more intense insurrectionist attempts, which I agree. There can be more extreme insurrectionist attempts. There can be more extreme coups. But the reality so is, this, this even if you want to wind it all end. the way back down, even if you want it all the way back down, say, like, okay, we'll ignore the tens of thousands of protesters outside. We can just go with 2,000 people. How, Glenn, how are you seriously going to argue that 2,000 people inside the Capitol with the goal of delaying the certification of the vote, which they accomplished, doesn't represent an insurrection? Wait, so before, I'll explain why. Wait, Glenn, it, Glenn, just before you go, okay. I, just want to, that's, I just want to put you on Glenn's question. So Glenn's uh, question was, he said, an insurrection in the, when there is an actual threat to democracy, I'm pushing off uh, that a vote isn't a threat to democracy. At what point did you call it an insurrection? Would you call it an insurrection on January 6th? I, I don't know, like, here's the thing. I don't know the thin line that they'd have to cross to call it an insurrection, but... Whatever line that is, it was crossed a long time ago. You had the president of the United States calling up over 100,000 people to D.C., and then he riled them up saying that they needed to essentially delay the vote. He was relying on Pence to do it. All of those protesters went to the White House. Um, a lot of them, or not to the White House, sorry, to the Capitol building. A lot of them broke into the Capitol building with the goal of delaying the certification of the vote because they didn't like the outcome of the election and they wanted to change it. They needed to fight like hell to take their country back because Mike Pence wasn't going to do the right thing by helping Trump do his constitutional coup. And so they turned it into an insurrection. It's, it's plenty of whatever. Now, if only 20 people went in, would I consider it an insurrection? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. If only, you know, 100 people went in, maybe. Uh, maybe if 200 people went in and they got further, maybe. Maybe. I'm not sure where exactly I would, you know, slice the pie to, to call it, you know, uh, whatever we call it. But wherever we're at, we're way, 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 way over that. And I just don't think the comparisons to other more extreme coups or more extreme rebellions or anything in Russia, it just doesn't make any sense. It's only done to equivocate on what's actually happened or to, to do a whataboutism to something that I would probably plainly, uh, plainly agree with. Like, wouldn't you agree this is a more serious coup or more serious insurrection? Yeah, sure, there can be more serious coups and more serious insurrections. Much the same, there could be more brutal murders of, of one person and another. It doesn't make one murder not a murder just because you did it easier or did it cleaner. Okay, so first of all, the reason, as I said at the start, why historical comparisons or historic comparisons to other incidents are so important is because there's a gigantic ideological and partisan motive here in exaggerating the extent to which what happened on January 6th was a serious threat. And especially when somebody is a Democratic Party partisan who goes around saying the Democratic Party is better, we want people to go and vote for Democrats, we want to make sure Donald Trump doesn't return to power, and at the same time the narrative they're pushing coincidentally aligns perfectly with their partisan agenda, then I think it's important to start questioning whether or not there's any authenticity of the beliefs based on how other situations have previously been treated. So let me just make two points here about what Donald Trump did. You're actually allowed to summon people to Washington to protest. It's one of the most important rights that the Constitution guarantees. The president is completely free to call his supporters to Washington and to tell them and argue for them that some injustice has been committed and that they ought to protest in response to it. There was one time and only one time 
when Donald Trump addressed the question of whether or not violence should be used when those people went to the Capitol. And what he said was this, quote, I know that everybody here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. And the fact that people, because he said peacefully, then have to resort to things like, oh, well, he invoked political cliches like fight like hell. Politicians use fight like hell in almost every speech. Joe Biden, you can read this in the New York Times on December 2nd, said, quote, I want to make sure we're going to be fighting like hell. You can find pretty much every politician saying that. So that's one thing, is that to the extent you want to say that Donald Trump was somehow a involved in this quote-unquote insurrection, the only thing he did was give a constitutionally protected speech, and that is the reason why Jack Smith has not charged him with inciting or participating in an insurrection. It's not my opinion. Obviously, Jack Smith shares the opinion that he could never obtain a conviction. The second thing is, on the numbers, 2,000 people, let's use the maximum number, went into the Capitol. A small percentage, a tiny percentage of people who went into the Capitol actually used violence. So most of those people, the vast majority, according to the U.S. government themselves, were doing nothing other than peacefully protesting. Again, protesters entering the Capitol without authorization, occupying offices of members of Congress in order to pressure them to take some step or not take some step is something that happens all the time. We've seen many more than 2,000 protesters. So don't try and imply that on January 6, 2,000 armed people or well-trained people intending to commit violence went into the Capitol. The most of that number that you could possibly squeeze out of it is something like 100 or 150, and now we're back way closer to the most ridiculous example that I began by asking you about, where even you said, oh, that probably shouldn't be called an insurrection, than we are to an actual threat to American power or to our system of government, which is necessary to claim in order to turn this into what you want to turn it into. Okay, just before I respond to this, so then do you think then that the Whiskey Rebellion or the Whiskey Insurrection, was that not a rebellion or insurrection then in your eyes? People His rebelling against things Wait, I'm sorry, wait, wait, say that again? You're, you're, I think you're, it's you're a rebellion. Up. I think it's a rebellion. I don't think I would call it an insurrection. I think it's perfectly fine to call it a rebellion. I would have to look a lot more into the facts of exactly what happened with the Whiskey Rebellion. I, don't ha I haven't thought about that question before. But I think the word rebellion is vague enough that any kind of protest could be called a rebellion. I mean, people who are protesting and interrupting political events and going to the White House and banging on the fence against the war in Israel and U.S. support for it are rebelling against U.S. policy. I don't have a problem with that term. But okay. I have to look at a lot more closely yeah. at the Whiskey Rebellion to be able to say definitively That's fine. whether I okay. that. If you want to make these arguments that any protest can be called a coup rebellion, you're free to make that argument. But you have to understand that you are using it in an ahistorical way that no legal, legal scholar, that nobody who's passed laws in Congress that refers to an insurrection or rebellion, literally nobody in the legislative or historical conduct in the United States has used rebellion or insurrection to mean protest. That has just never been the case. It that's is entirely at all. What? That's not, my, my argue, that's not my argument at all. My argument is that what happened on January 6th was a protest. That's fine, and but I'm saying that you're, you, what you just said, what you violent. just said, any two people knocking on a fence might be considered a rebellion or insurrection. That can be no, your that, assessment, or that the Whiskey wouldn't. Rebellion wasn't, was, it, was a rebellion but not an insurrection. That might be your uh, assessment, but at the time, it was known as the Whiskey Insurrection, which was around the time when people were drafting the 14th Amendment. So I would think that their understanding of what an insurrection was at the time is probably a more important analysis than what your personal subjective and convenient interpretation of what an insurrection might be right now. You're, you, I, now you're just ranting. I mean, this claim that like everyone who was ever involved in the lawmaking process or the legislative process sees the term as you do. You, you, we can agree, just like to set this fact straight, that Jack Smith, who charged Donald Trump with many crimes, including crimes that were considered quite aggressive from a prosecutorial perspective, like he was not a overly cautious prosecutor, but a quite aggressive one who stretched a lot of theories to accuse him of certain felonies, he chose not to accuse Donald Trump of a crime that is in the U.S. Code, which is participating in or inciting an insurrection. You agree that that's not part of what Jack Smith charged Donald I Trump I agree with, that right? Jack Smith hadn't charged him with that, but whether or not somebody did something isn't relevant to a particular criminal charge. You have an, say, well, I well, mean, I mean so there's two reasons. Well, one is because, because all members of the lawmakers are on your side. Why didn't he? 
Well, because one, if we're talking about, for instance, the 14th Amendment, a criminal conviction isn't relevant here. We don't need a criminal conviction for. No, I'm asking you why Jack Smith. I'm not talking about the the banning from the ballot. That'll be a U.S. Supreme Court decision. And Mm -hmm. the courts have thus far split on that question. Democratic Mm -hmm. judges in Colorado and then secretaries of state in California and Rhode Island both have taken the opposite position. I'm not asking you about whether he should be stricken from the ballot or you need a, a criminal conviction. I'm asking you, why did not why did Jack Smith? an extremely aggressive prosecutor in these cases, not charge Donald Trump with inciting or participating in an insurrection. It could be for a variety of reasons. It could be that that's well, a question. Do you, do you have actually, an idea? A, well, I was, I was about to, but then you cut me off. Yeah, Go ahead. it could be that he feels like he doesn't have enough strength to secure a conviction for insurrection. It could be that if you actually read the statute um, for insurrection, even the, the criminal statute itself is like kind of vague because it uses insurrection like in the statute of insurrection. It doesn't really give much guidance as to what it is. Nobody in the history of the United States has ever been charged with that particular crime. Um, and it, yeah, it could just be that he felt like there was an easier prosecutor path to go, you're not seriously making, you're not of the contention right now that if somebody isn't charged with a particular crime, nobody thought they did it, right? You don't think that prosecutors just think that we're going to charge you with everything we think you did, right? You understand that when people are charging crimes, they're charging what they think they can get a conviction on, yeah? Yes, having worked in the legal profession as a lawyer for more than a decade, I do actually understand that sometimes prosecutors opt not to charge people with crimes, even though they may think they're guilty. What I'm saying is this specific case of a prosecutor who has demonstrated an eagerness to be extremely aggressive in the charging documents, including bringing crimes that many legal experts, including ones who aren't pro-Trump, believe is quite a stretch and will be very difficult to prove in court, opted not to charge Donald Trump with participating in or inciting an insurrection. I think your answer is actually correct, that he believes it would be very difficult to prove that what took place on January 6th was an insurrection and or that Trump participated in or incited it. And I think it's an extremely important point. It is not just positive. Maybe Jack Smith had suddenly some kind of like secret motive that made him not do that. But everything we know about Jack Smith and what he was doing in these cases, I think leads us to at least acknowledge that that's pretty relevant. That not only Jack Smith, in fact, no prosecutor, despite being very aggressive and wanting to convict Donald Trump of crimes, chose to accuse him of that crime. And I do think it's worth being asking, why not? If Donald Trump actually incited an insurrection, as you believe, I would hope that the prosecutor would charge him with that crime. But I agree with Jack Smith's decision not to because I think it would be very close to impossible to prove that that was an insurrection that he participated in or incited. So if all these legal theorists and legal scholars that you're so well acquainted with unanimously agree with your view, why wouldn't Jack Smith do that? Are you angry Jack Smith didn't charge him with that? Uh, I would want Jack Smith to pursue. It's a federal court, so I'd want him to pursue whatever charges he thinks he can get Trump the most on, not just any particular thing that he thinks he might have done. There might be a number of political reasons why he decided not to go the insurrection charge route, least of all the fact that it would be the first time a criminal charge like this has ever been attempted to be used in the entire history of the United States, and also because it might actually call into question too much uh, you know, what is First Amendment speech versus not, and trying to convict a former president or something like that might be a really hairy political question that the federal courts, for whatever reason, feel like they just don't want to get involved in. So they went on what they thought were more more solid legal grounds that wouldn't put them, uh, you know, in the eyes of the American public right during an election that would cause force them to have to answer essentially an incredibly difficult political question regarding protected speech, which is why I like the route that Jack Smith went, where he's going after, uh, I think, much cleaner legal questions relating to obvious matters of obstruction um, that are, are cleaner and simpler than trying to define, you know, what is insurrection when the statute itself doesn't even necessarily call it out. But again, to recenter this idea that because he didn't charge for a particular crime, we can't say that J6 wasn't an insurrection just, again, doesn't make sense when no one has ever been charged with insurrection in the United States. I think we all agree that uh, the Civil War was at the very least an insurrection, if not a full on rebellion. Nobody was charged after the Civil War with insurrection as a crime. It doesn't mean we don't think that they weren't insurrectionists, right? Right. For political for political reasons. But in the case of Jack Smith, and I want to let this go because my argument is not that it's dispositive. My argument that is that it's rather relevant. Now, can, let me ask. Let me ask you this. Because this is something I was really trying to pursue in the last debate. I, I don't think we ever got to have a dialogue on it. So I just want to return to it, which is the following. If Donald Trump, let's assume that you are right, that Donald Trump had an intention to incite a coup or an insurrection in the United States that he was hell-bent on breaking the law in order to cling to political power. There were all sorts of things that he not only could have done, but that typically people trying to perpetrate coups in almost every case do do. 
namely, right up until the time that he peacefully walked out of the White House on January 20th before noon, which is the time when the peaceful transition of power occurs, Trump was the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He was the head of the executive branch, which means under his command, he had the entire U.S. military, all sorts of agencies that are very well armed and very trained, and all of whom are duty-bound to obey his orders. Maybe some of them would have refused, but probably a lot of them would have obeyed. A lot of them were probably on his side. We heard for years how there were all these fascist and white supremacist factions within these military units. Why do you think that if Donald Trump wanted to per 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 perpetrate a coup, he didn't do what almost every other person capable of this who perpetrated uh -huh. a coup has done, which is order the military or these other armed agencies to surround the White House, keep anybody who tried to came, come and, and get him out, and ensure that he remains in power using violence or other illegitimate and illegal means? Like, why didn't he even try that? You're asking me why Donald Trump didn't order the military when he already thought uh, Milley was literally a treasonous actor for not giving him all the information that he thought he was entitled to for military guns. You're asking me why he didn't ask the military to help him when he already disagreed with so many members of the military. You're asking why he didn't ask the intelligence services to help him that he had said since the start of his presidency were engaged in Russia collusion hoax and with Peter Strzok and his text messages and with the Hunter Biden laptop that were all set against him. You're asking me the question of why didn't Donald Trump order the very parts of his government that he thought were backstabbing the most to help him ensure his coup? Is that what, just to be clear, that's the question you're asking? Asking me? Yeah, and I'll tell okay, you why. Okay, the answer, the answer many, why is because he didn't have any of these people on his side and he knew it. That's why he fired people like Comey. That's why he tried to intimidate and bully every other part of his administration that wouldn't follow him, whether it was Jeff Sessions when he served as temporary attorney general, or um, whether it was uh, his own, uh, trying to undermine his own attorney general Barr when he turned against him, whether it was trying to undermine literally every other part of his government that turned against him. Like Donald Trump didn't have any friends anywhere. The idea that he wouldn't turn to, uh, you know, other members of the government to help him, like the military or the Secret Service agencies, or not the, the intelligence agencies is not only is it like well why didn't he do it well it's obvious why he wouldn't do it because he didn't think these people had his back i think the more difficult question for you is that if he really didn't think that it, there was going to be like violence at the capitol if he really didn't want any of that to happen why didn't donald trump pick up the phone and call anybody to get the national guard there to protect the Capitol building, when Pence, when, when Ivanka, when Meadows went in over and over again, when other congressmen were calling him, why is it that when the violence was at its peak, why was it just him, Eastman, and Giuliani making phone calls to other congressmen to, surprise, surprise, delay the certification of the vote? Okay, I'm gonna, I promise I'm going to answer that, but I want to go back to the question that I posed to you first and the answer that you gave to me. Oftentimes, first of all, if it's true that the leaders of the armed forces and the intelligence community and every one of these armed executive agency branches, in, even including ATM and all D, the DEA and all these other ones, all were in the posture that they did not regard themselves as duty bound to follow Donald Trump's orders. If you're somebody, and I don't mean you're saying this had already been the case. Hold on. I can I just as a real quick, as when you say this, you just as a real quick, you keep saying this duty bound to follow Trump's orders. The oath that you take is to the Constitution of the United States, not to the president of the United States. Just to be very you clear. The, go ahead. You have the right. No, the president is the head of the executive branch. He's the commander in chief of the armed forces. And he is below so the Constitution. Are, so he is below the, the Constitution. So if, you, if you are in the military. You are duty bound to obey orders. Now, you can object if you think the order is illegal. You do actually have that right. And as I said in my question, I'm sure a lot of them would have done that. But there's no question that there are members of the military and members in these agencies that absolutely were loyal to Trump. And oftentimes what has happened in coups and those sorts of other things is that members of the various military branches or of the armed wings of the government break up into factions and often start fighting one another. That's how you get a civil war. So even if Milley or the leader of the CIA, who at that point was Gina Haspel, who he had actually appointed, would have done what you claim, which is a pretty significant threat to democracy, that they regarded themselves as antithetical or adversarial to the president, not subordinate to him, there's definitely a good chance that a lot of those people who have guns and run the power structure of the United States would have answered his call and been on his side. The fact that he didn't even try is so reflective of the fact that this was not an insurrectionary intent, that he walked out of the office peacefully 
on January 20th at noon, the way every other president previous to him had done as part of the peaceful transition of power. There were so many things that he could have done. Now, tell me, just remind me what the question is that you asked that I promise you. Yeah, yeah. Before, before we do this, can I actually take a step back? Because I just want to just want to actually take a step back. So, so, Glenn, you said it wasn't an insurrection because on January 6th, there was no threat to actually overthrowing democracy or actually doing anything major. Uh, Destiny, as far as I understood from your previous response, and I want to get this clear before we move on, you're, you're saying it's not just January 6th. There's also all the events leading up to it. And that's are, I, I think that I think that's a lot of it, but we don't even have to... We don't even is have to. Worth, is it yeah. worth going into it just so we exactly know what you what you would why you think it's an insurrection and what specific events led up to it? We, we can go into that to get to assign more uh, culpability to Trump, but we don't need that. Just on the on the events of J six itself, it is very plainly and clearly obvious, um, unless you have heavy political motivations to believe otherwise, that what happened was an insurrection. Um, they're just every single element is there. And, and we can try to pivot with this like, well, usually people do this. I agree that usually people do some things. Um, but just because usually people do something doesn't mean that it, that's always the case. As you've said yourself, you know, there are constitutional coups. Some people might consider the Enabling Act that, you know, Hitler did in order to become a dictator in, in Germany was a kind of constitutional coup. Some people claim that Evo Morales in Bolivia was enacting, trying to enact some sort of coup. Some people say that in Ukraine, uh, when Yanukovych left and that, uh, that parliament decided to elect a new president. Some people call that a coup. There are lots of coups that can happen that or, or rebellions or not rebellions. There are lots of coups that can happen that are for a variety of reasons not involving the military. We can look at the president and say, well, why didn't he try? We can think of a number of reasons why he didn't try. Because he didn't have the support of the military, because he thought it would be incredibly risky, because he thought it would devolve into chaos. He wouldn't have a clean transition of power. Nobody here is claiming that Trump is brave. Nobody here is claiming that Trump wants to lead an armed insurrection to the White House. He wasn't, his own handlers told him that he wasn't even allowed to go to the White House, even when he begged that he wanted the Secret Service to drive him there. So forever, we can think of a number of reasons why Trump you know, didn't actually order the military to go and show up and start killing people. What I'm curious, though, is... To, to my question, you asked me what my question was. Why did Trump sit and watch the violence carry on at the White at the uh, Capitol building and not try to intervene, despite the fact that he had the authority and many would argue the responsibility to do so? Why would he sit and watch it? Well, first of all, when Trump and people think may have thought he waited too long, he realized it took him too long to realize the significance of the events. Although I don't see the events as nearly as significant as you. We've had tons of protests before. At the Capitol, he knew those people were angry and had gone there to protest. But he actually did. First, he went on Twitter and he told everybody there, "Leave now! Don't use violence. Violence is not the kind of thing." Hold that on, we just do. as a quick Repeating fact check, he did not that say that in his first. He did not say that on Twitter. He said that on, that on, 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 in tweets on January 6th. He absolutely did. Repeating the message that he gave to the crowd before they went to the Capitol, which is, "I know that you're going to go there and peacefully." protest. That was the message that he consistently delivered to them, both before January 6th at the protest and after. Secondly, this, again, this was a protest that turned into a riot that was quelled in a matter of hours. It started in the afternoon and it was over in the afternoon. And in order to quell it, they didn't even need to open fire. As we know now, we should have known this two years ago, but the January 6th commission purposely concealed the videos that negated the kind of narrative they wanted to feed, a lot of the people who ended up in the Capitol ended up in the Capitol because the Capitol Police opened the door. And this is just not true. Can we focus on one false fact at a time before we dive into like every conspiracy theory that for some, I don't know why it's people, not a conspiracy theory. it is a conspiracy we, we theory. The, We've seen we all the videos. Video. I, I watched it on, on video. Which video? Everyone what what video did you watch? Video. The videos that were actually released finally to the public, not handpicked by Adam Schiff and Liz Cheney, once Kevin McCarthy and then Mike Johnson fulfilled their promise to make sure the public could see all of the video, oh, not the video that they handpicked. You're right. I'm sorry. You're are you talking video, about the you're but, talking about the footage that McCarthy handpicked to give to Tucker Carlson that he made a 30 minute documentary no, out of? No, I'm talking about the decision by Mike Johnson, a promise he made as a condition to be a less speaker to make all of the January 6th surveillance footage available to the public, not just the hand-picked parts that Liz Cheney and Adam Schiff decided to show us. It was all an effort from the very beginning to lie in order to exaggerate and make this event seem much worse than it was, including this insane claim that was an absolute lie that Brian Sicknick was murdered by a savage mob of Trump supporters when he had his skull bashed in with a fire extinguisher until he okay, died. Okay, 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 hold on. One, one fake claim at a time. So, firstly, Donald so, Trump's oh, initial oh. tweets, Donald Trump's initial tweets were not to leave. 
And when you ask, when you, when you claim over and over again that, you know, they managed to calm it down in three hours, it out, that was because finally, like two or three hours after everything on Trump's, I think it was his third tweet, after being begged over and over again, after ha- already having the note delivered and sitting on his desk that Ashley Babbitt had been shot and killed, he finally tweeted, okay, you guys can go home. We love you. You're very special. You know, congratulations. The initial and two tweets. Violence. The initial two tweets that Donald Trump tweeted were not telling people to go home. He already knew there was an ongoing riot, and he tweeted to encourage his supporters to continue protesting. Donald Trump was the president of the United States, who was the highest on the pecking order for delivering the National Guard to protect the Capitol building, and he failed to do that. He failed to, 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 to do that duty that he had that was exclusively under the purview of the president because D.C. is federal ground, and he, did, and he didn't do it to stop his protesters that were there to try to delay the certification of the vote of an election that he lost. And during that three, that that three hour time game period, game. all he was doing was making phone calls or telling Giuliani, his stooge, to make phone calls to other congressmen to delay the certification of the vote, which is exactly what he was trying to do, which is exactly what an insurrection is. It's having a large group uh, the, of people engaged in violence an, trying an to stop the lawful is, execution of government action, which is exactly what every historical person has believed. The fact that the fact that you have to res- resort to this kind of nitpicky behavior, like, oh, he didn't tweet uh, soon enough. He, it, would, it took three whole hours to get these people very easily to march peacefully out of the Capitol is more than anything that I could do to show what an absurd farce this entire thing is. Like Wait, you so mentioned that, other Glenn, historical that's... examples. And by the way, like, please stop Glenn, using our the, time to like, constantly that's proclaim that's like, Glenn, everybody the, agrees that. with me. It's so clearly and provably true that what I'm saying is correct. These are not arguments. Let's just like eliminate that fluff and try and focus on like the substance you can go and do all your post video like post debate videos about why you won to your audience but for now let's just focus on the facts okay so focus on the facts on the facts like, how do the first people get into the capitol building were let, they let, let in or did they me, break let, in let, 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 let's let go me, back to the tweet well, i just want to focus on the tweet because destiny you said that yeah you actually posted tweets encouraging them to actually continue what tweets were those because uh, glenn said of course that was he actually told them to stop so when um when the when the riots were going on at the Capitol, um, Mark Meadows, because other people went to him and other people, um, continued to go in. Uh, initially, it was to talk to Trump, and then I think just to Meadows because Trump had locked himself in his room, just watching what was going on, begging him to please tweet out something and stop. Tell your supporters to go home. And for the first two tweets that Trump set out, he refused to tell people to go home because he enjoyed the protest, because he liked the violence, because he thought it would probably increase his chances of furthering, uh, delaying the certification of the vote. But those first two tweets that he sent, yes, after three hours when he realized that it wasn't going to help. Yes. On the third tweet, if you look at any of the examples, even like you mentioned Bolivia, where the coup was not, according to most observers of Bolivia, that the... Evo Morales tried to stay in office. Evo Morales was given the go-ahead to run for a term by the electoral court appointed by the Constitution to make those judgments and allowed him to run for a fourth term. Evo Morales ran. He won. People in the West claimed, because they didn't want him to win, that, and it's so ironic, the fraud claim ended up being because he was only eight or nine points ahead and you have to be ten points in order to avoid a runoff and win on the first round, that a bunch of Morales votes came in late at night to put him over that 10%, very similar to Trump's claim about why there was fraud. It's absolutely was not claim. similar. The claim was that those servers that were being ran were completely and totally unmonitored, not part of any election monitoring uh, procedure, and that nobody yep. could okay. verify any of the votes that were you going have, in and no out of that server. You, you I no absolutely know what I was talking about. You and the fact no that you say that even Morales right, was, right, was, right, was, was allowed to run for another term, time. the reason why people accuse it of being a coup is because, or why they thought it was, was because he was in charge of electing or appointing a lot of the uh, court members that would eventually go on to overturn the part of the Constitution that allowed him to run for a third and fourth term. Right, the idea that he, he just let the, that the, years the court— Because he had been president, but he had been president— Let me make my point about Bolivia. He was president for 12 years. When, what happened was when he was declared the winner, and even think tanks that had suspected fraud ultimately reviewed all of what happened, and the reason there were so many pro-Morales votes— At the end is because the outer regions with indigenous and rural voters, which had always been his base, are always the votes that come in late and which is what put him over the top. But not only did I report on this, I was the first journalist to interview Eva Morales in English after those that series of events and in order to interview him. I couldn't go to Bolivia 
You know why he couldn't go to Bolivia? Because he had been driven out of Bolivia by the military and the police that threatened to murder him and his whole family if he didn't believe, uh, leave Bolivia. He then had to go to Mexico where he sought asylum, and that's where I interviewed him. And then in that next week, the interim coup government, the leaders of whom are now in prison, ended up murdering all of the, not all, but many of the peaceful protesters who were contesting the fact that the military and the police drove Evo Morales out of the country. That's what happens in a coup. When the people with the guns come and say, we're now taking over. We're going to decide who's in power. We don't care that you were certified the winner of the election. We demand that you either leave Bolivia or we're going to murder you. Every event that is seriously to under, viewed as a coup, whether the coups of, in South America throughout the Cold War, the coup in Iran that has happened, you go through all over the world and you look at coups, almost always they involve not 100 people or 120 people for two hours protesting and rioting in the Capitol, none of whom pulled out a gun and discharged a weapon at any point. It involves real sustained violence by the serious factions in that country that dominate with violence. And nothing like that happened here on January 6th. The it's reality the was thing. there was violence on J6. You literally, we've all Perpetra watched the videos. Yes. There were a small number of Trump supporters, as I said, 10% of the people charged how did they get who were engaged how, in fighting how did they, with the police. How, how did many, they get into the? How did they get into the Capitol, how many, Glenn? How, how did they get into the Capitol? They they used force in order to break in. Yes, I'm not saying that. Okay, saying so they used they, force not, to break into the Capitol. Okay, how did they get through the rest when cops were pointing guns at them, saying, "Don't come in here"? What were they doing? They were breaking windows. How did Ashley Babbitt get shot? They were trying to go to places where lawmakers were, where they were saying, "Don't come." And what did they end up doing? They delayed the certification of the vote or the execution by, by, by of the law of Congress of, of the Constitution. How, how, okay, how, many, how, how many people? How many people on January six? Glenn, Dude, all of these questions are bullshit. Let, let me, how, many how many people is not a real, that's how, not a real contention. How, it doesn't matter. You can not think much of my questions, but I'd still appreciate if you answered them. How many people on January 6th were killed by these quote unquote insurrectionists? How many people did they kill on January 6th? It doesn't 6th? matter. Well, how, many died and, how many people, how many people you, died in Fort Sumter? How many people died for the start of the civil war in the United States? How many people died in Fort Sumter? Just answer to humor me. How many people were killed by the insurrectionists on January 6th? I guess it depends on if you if you count them taking drugs. Is that killing themselves? <laughs> right. The, well, the only people who died, right, you can say some of them actually died and one of them was shot by the Capitol Hill police. But the people who are being called insurrectionists or the attempted coup against the most powerful militarized nation in the world did not kill a single person on January 6th. That was why the anti-Trump media had to invent that has a lie no in that, that no, no stop he, with that the weird Capitol partisan Hill police officer. Oh it God. shows what a joke you're such a partisan you're such a partisan was. hack. Just engage with the facts. Both of us agree that you don't need people to die for it to be an insurrection, right? So Wait, why I'm do you a, keep bringing I'm that a up? Partisan, I'm a, you're the one who goes around devoting yourself and urging people to vote for one of the two political parties. I have never done that in my entire life. The, I, I've spent the last four months attacking one of the core policies of the Republican Party, which is U.S. support for Israel. I don't That's go around great. encouraging people to Glenn, vote for the Republican Glenn, Party. Why, why does, why does, the one who goes around. Your entire community is Glenn, filled with Glenn. Democratic Party partisans. Glenn, How dare bring, you call anybody else a partisan? That is what you are at your gotcha. core destiny. Glenn, Glenn, and, can I bring it back to, Glenn, can I bring it back to the debate? So you said that. He, no, where's the destiny? Let, let's just go back to the debate. You said that no point was this an attempted cure at all. So I just want, I know it's not exactly on January 6th, but I want to talk something about this. So there was a phone Call. Trump made a phone call to a governor, I'm sure you've heard it went really well, not really well, but it was, went quite big, of him asking to find 11,000 votes. Would you not call that at all, or doing a coup, or trying to bring votes to win? No, if you assume that Trump believed that there was serious voter fraud in Georgia, as he did believe, and as he was being told by many of his advisors, including lawyers who had been celebrated as some of this country's most prestigious lawyers for years, who were telling him there was ample voter fraud in Georgia, he was trying to say, I don't even need you to prove that every last ballot that was fraudulent be discovered. I just need you to find 11,000. I know the interpretation that people want to give to that. They always want to try and pretend that Trump meant something sinister, like, oh, invent 12,000 cases of voter fraud so that I can win Georgia. That isn't all what the context was. The context was, I believe there was ample fraud in Georgia. People are telling me in an informed way there's ample fraud in Georgia. I personally don't believe that, that claim, to be clear. but that was the context of what that call was about. 
And so, I mean, if that is a coup, you call someone up and you say, I think that, first of all, this is not the first time that people have believed that elections were committed by fraud. In fact, He's gonna bring Democrats believe that the last three elections that they lost yep. were illegitimate. Uh. In 1960, historians widely believe that that election was stolen by a combination of voter fraud in Chicago that made John Kennedy the winner over Richard Nixon. There was it's that every incident talking where Hawaii point, had whatever two you can to not engage with the actual of, of electors. Substance 1876, of what's going on. Yeah. there was a huge, pervasive allegations of voter fraud. You can sit there and mutter all you want, Destiny. I'm not going to play on your little field. If you don't want to look at history, you don't want to put this in context. It's the reason is, is because you have blinders on. You only know the CNN version of the world. You're one of those people who only began paying attention. Okay, to so then let, let's just let's just be very clear. Then would you Donald say, Trump. sure? Would you say that the Battle of Fort Sumter? Would you consider that the Fort Sumter event? Would that have been an insurrection to you? Even only without one person died. Else, without anything else that followed, without the entire yes, civil without war anything happening? else that followed. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I would consider that an insurrection or not. I don't okay, so for the, the whiskey insurrection, the where where no Fort Sumter is because of the part that it played in the Civil War. It's the Civil War that made that so historic. Well, that's fine, but again, your analysis there is ahistorical because people considered that others that were giving aid to Confederate states uh, as they succeeded before any actual violence happened were insurrectionists. So if you think that Fort Sumter was not an insurrection of the Civil War, followed, that's fine. That's an insane um, take. Uh, Given, especially given that Lincoln literally invoked the Insurrection Act right after Fort Sumter, but that's fine if you think that wasn't an insurrection. Okay, so for the whiskey well, rebellion, because, then because, would you, do you think do you, for the whiskey insurrection that also con- wasn't an insurrection because not, people didn't die? Would, or but Fort Sumter did not just appear out of nowhere. It was not a spontaneous protest that turned into a riot. It was part oh, of what part became of? an obvious attempt on the part of the South to launch a rebellion against the North and to secede from the Union. Lincoln knew what was going to follow. And I think this is an important point. If what happened after January 6th involved acts of Donald Trump trying to extend what happened on January 6th by repeating violent protests or trying to threaten the stability of the United States government in all the different ways that he could have done but chose not to, had he not walked out peacefully of the White House on January 20th, we were looking at all of these sets of events differently. That's an imaginary history that would make it more like the Civil War. None of that happened, however. So Fort all Sumter, if the Civil War... And Donald Trump walking gotcha. out of the White House peacefully. So the Civil War, if it, or, or for Fort Sumter, for the Civil War that followed, if that hadn't had followed, even though Lincoln invoked the Insurrection Act to deal with Fort Sumter, you would say that that wasn't an attempted insurrection. That wasn't an insurrection. I mean, it's such, a, it's such a counterfactual and such a hypothetical that it's impossible to imagine taking Fort Sumter, tearing it out of its context of a nation that had been heading for civil war for a long time where, where they were doing everything possible to avert it. Lincoln understood that Fort Sumter was not some isolated event of a two-hour riot that was easily subdued, but knew that the entire South was armed to fight against the North. Take Fort Sumter and completely change every single fact and tear it out of its historical context, and then trying to debate whether or not it's insurrection is a child's game. There's let's so say that let's say that after dudes. Fort Sumter, let's say they were crushed so hard and so fast that there was a sweeping change of mind among the states, and they were like, you know what? Oof, this Lincoln guy seems serious. Let's not go to war and have hundreds of thousands of us die. And they decide to do to not do that instead. In your eyes, Fort Sumter would have then not been an insurrection. Yeah, I think there's a good analogy to that, which is the one I mentioned earlier, which is what happened in Russia, where Prigozhin. No, no, let's just talk about rep- the United no, States. No, no, no. You, <laughs> no, you want it? We're going to pivot to the U- to Russia, I, a totally different no, system no. with a totally different set of laws, with you're a totally no, different. No. You're saying no, no, stick to this. This in, is such an easy yes. It was obviously an insurrection. It was so obviously an insurrection. The no, idea that you're I'm trying to argue that Fort Sumter was only an insurrection because of acts that came after is unbelievable to me. The, what and, came after and, was a and rebellion. The, and the acts that came before. The idea that Fort Sumter was analogous in any way to January 6th, even taking Fort Sumter and imagining it, nothing else happened after. That is what is ahistorical. If you're, the, 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 uh, what a real coup looks like is what Prigozhin tried to do in Russia. But in the context of Russian history, even in a few years from now, that will be a tiny little footnote because it never posed a serious or meaningful threat to the system of power that governs Russia. It was crushed in 12 hours, and now Prigozhin is dead. So if you have the magnitude of these events is what matters so much. Like when the very first thing you said in that first debate was you tried to create 
this dichotomous framework, this very reductive binary framework that either you believe, and this is almost quoting you verbatim, you said, either you believe that the insurrection was justified and that nothing wrong happened on January 6th, or you have to admit that there was a coup. And the very first thing I did when I spoke was, was linked onto that and said, that is an absurd framework. Of course, there's a gigantic difference between acknowledging that people behaved poorly on January 6th, behaved in ways we wish would not happen, seeing citizens be shot despite being unarmed How many people died for the, the, the proposed stuff? How people many people died fight? when he did his attempted coup? What, they shot down a few helicopters? Was it like five or ten people that died? How many people even died for that? They, 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 there were more than two dozen Russian troops that were killed. Imagine if the group of people at the Capitol had shot down actual U.S. military planes and military jets and murdered American soldiers. So they for one person, so if instantly. how many people needed to die then on J6 for you to think that that was a coup insurrection? What is the number then there? The criterion for me is not how many people died. The criterion for me is how serious of a threat did it pose or does it pose to the actual system of power in the United States. And the fact that this two-hour, three-hour riot filled with people who were too obese to get off the couch without dropping down of heart attacks and maybe had a couple of dozen or a few dozen well-armed and well-trained people there, that it ever posed a meaningful threat to the system of power in the United States is a complete and utter joke. It reminds me so much of the people who tried to say that Russia buying a few Facebook ads or a few Twitter bots was the kind of interference in the democracy fine. I don't know that why you're pivoting to no one is talking about because, Hillary or or no, the it, laptops. I, you know like, what an analogy which, is? An analogy is no, when It's not an analogy. It's a what about is I'm going to pivot because another. you don't want to actually argue the facts of this. That's what it is. What they're not analogies. What, they're the not used to strengthen their argument. They're used to obfuscate. The, the it's just, what about so let's, 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 go back, let's, let's go back to January 6th. So, so Glenn said that not on January 6th, there was no actual, at uh, no point in time was an actual threat to the democracy. Destiny, is that what specific point would you say, or specific example, could you say, no, this was a threat? It's a fantastic delusion. If you were to take Glenn or anybody else, Else that has their whatever their their partisan takes on this if you were to take them put them in a room with artists and animators and then have them describe what j6 was then the animators would draw i don't know i guess like 500 greenpeace activists picketing outside the capitol building with signs saying we don't like that you guys are trying to steal the election that's what it sounds like and then maybe a few of them got led in by the capitol police to walk around Thankfully, however, thank God, we're in an era where we all have videos, we all have the internet, we can see the tens of thousands of people outside screaming, we can watch the brawling with screaming, the Metropolitan screaming. Police, that, that's not all they did, Glenn, we can watch them brawling with the Metropolitan Police, we can watch them breaking into the Capitol from like 500 different angles, we can watch Ashley Babbitt getting shot as she's trying to crawl through a window where lawmakers are in direct opposition to federal police shooting her, we can watch every single one of these events on unfold in real time, and it doesn't look like anything that's being described by Glenn. Instead, the only response is Glenn says, we saw the real videos because Tucker Carlson published 0.3% of the footage that McCarthy granted him that doesn't change any of the underlying facts of what we've seen. Yeah, were oh there some God, people you, that were you, walking you really, through the Capitol you, you, building because the police really were trying to Glenn, guide them to another mean. area where they could more heavily, more easily secure it? Yeah, of course. Were some people guided through and then led into a chamber because police had an easier control of that area than something else? Yeah, sure. But again, we've all seen the videos. You admitted yourself that the first entrance into the Capitol broke in. The first people to breach the barricades broke them down. Nobody was let into a new initial area because the Capitol Police let them in. They were only sometimes ushered through the building because there were more defensible positions, which is obvious if you've watched any of the video footage available of that day, besides the selected clips that people like Tucker Carlson or Glenn Greenwald want you to watch on Twitter. Again, if this okay. was so easy and so simple and there was nobody there but a bunch of fat people, how did the certification of our vote get delayed by three hours? And three why were we hours. waiting for the oh national God. For the first time in all of history. Three hours. Three oh, as hours. opposed to what, I mean, Glenn? How did the United? How did the Republic survive? First of all, let me just. Glenn, how long was the story about Hunter's laptop delayed? Let, how long? Let, how, let how me, many? Me, like, how many days was that delayed? One day, and me, you guys say that let, that was a more serious thing, right? Because Facebook, the story was delayed by one day. Come Facebook, on. Facebook suppressed that story all the way up until the time of the election, algorithmically. But let me just—I I, want to go back to the history of the what we saw with the videos because you obviously are not familiar with this history. At the beginning, for two years, all of the information that we got about January 6 was controlled by a partisan commission filled with effectively Democrats. The people Nancy Pelosi let onto the commission, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, hated Trump, 
almost more than any Democrat did. Those were the two Republicans. Because Just Nancy as, a, Pelosi as a quick thing, you can't, you can't lie. That's not but true. Uh, this, Pelosi that, would have so allowed the, others. The, Pelosi was going to oh. allow people on there. But unfortunately, McCarthy, when he nominated five, two of those people, uh, Jim Jordan and uh, something, Johnson, I think, maybe. Can, um, can, I, can I just spend it? Can I well, you're just lying. Yeah, you can't just like lie. Time. You can't just say yeah. things no. that are lies. No, Pelosi I'm, I'm accepted people from McCarthy. Nancy, McCarthy didn't want to nominate more people. That's his fault. Sorry, go ahead. Nancy, Jim Nancy, Pol- Nancy Pelosi was the first ever Speaker of the House in 225 years to reject the nominees by the opposing party to serve on an investigative commission. It had never happened in the history of the United States. She was the first one to do it. And so <laughs> when Nancy Pelosi let, let, said... Let's let's ask Destiny that question. Why, why did Nancy Pelosi reject those two Republican... Why did she reject them? <clears throat> So when Nancy Pelosi was forming this committee, she said that McCarthy could nominate five people. Of those five people, um, I think it was Jim Jordan and somebody Banks, two of these people, a a lot of the J6 investigations were probably going to be analyzing their behavior specifically. And Pelosi felt like the presence of those two people on the committee would have poisoned the committee. So she told McCarthy, I accept your other three nominees. Just give me two others and they can be part of the committee as well. But McCarthy, because he knew January 6th was an insurrection and because he knew that the behavior that day was in defensible, decided to pull all the Republican nominees and say, you know what? Screw you. I'm not going to give you anybody. You can just have uh, Kissinger and uh, uh, Cheney or whatever, the two people that I know hate Trump, so that afterwards, conveniently, people like Glenn can make this exact bullshit argument where they say, oh, well, actually, it was a completely partisan committee, so I'm going to ignore the fact that 95% of the people that were actually uh, testifying were Republicans and ignore the fact that all of this under oath and ignore the fact that all the evidence is easily available, and I'm just going to hand wave all of it by calling, par- calling it partisan. Meanwhile, I'm going to believe everything that, I guess, uh, Russia Today tweets about it or everything that tucker carlson uh puts on his show about it or everything that I, 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 uh, mccarthy I, I, I himself says about it that was the thing yeah go ahead Eli, I, I i just want to go back to the history of the sure. first of all I'll, I'll say one more time of the videos. never before yeah. in the history of the republic did nancy pelosi did any speaker of the house or majority leader do what nancy pelosi did the prerogative of the minority party to pick their own members to serve on that commission was never subject to the approval of the opposing party until nancy pelosi while the Democratic Party always claims it's upholding norms and health and tradition, decided to block the choices. And so it's true, the Republicans decided we're not going to participate in a farce where for the first time in 225 years of our history, Nancy Pelosi gets to choose who cannot be on the panel, even that's even though that's who we want and think will be most effective on there. And as a result, Nancy Pelosi ended up choosing those two Republicans. They were the ones willing to serve when the rest of the Republicans weren't, and it became a partisan farce. Had she allowed Kevin McCarthy's members the way every other speaker for 225 years had done, you would have had an actual bipartisan commission. As a result, the only videos that we saw were videos that were handpicked by these very partisan anti-Trump members who then were allowed to create a narrative filled with lies, beginning with Brian Sicknick getting his head bashed in, and then hiding the videos that undermined their narrative and only allowing us to see the videos that made it look as violent as possible. Then... Kevin McCarthy gave the rest of the video the video to Tucker Carlson so that he could report on them. But that's not even what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that it was Mike Johnson, the newly elected speaker, who released all of the video. And only then did we see the video for the very first time after two and a half years of these people who were walking into the Capitol being led in by the Capitol Police after they opened the doors and led them in peacefully. So... You all that you can say all of these things about January 6th. I said from the very beginning that your tactic is to create this binary where either someone has to say, well, wait, if you want to do facts, that's fine. I don't need to announce my tactic. I said from the beginning, I said from the beginning that it was a riot. There were people who were there on behalf of Donald Trump who used violence. There were police officers who ended up injured as a result, just like happened in the Black Lives Matter protest. Although, actually, police officers, at least one of them for sure, and probably a few others, were killed and the amount of injuries were far greater. I also don't consider the Black Lives Matter movement, even though it was a lot of people there had insurrectionary intent, anarchist groups and Antifa and others. I don't consider that an insurrection either, though I think you can make a much stronger case that the damage and violence that it posed to our prevailing law and order system was far greater than what happened on January 6th. So yes, you are right that some people used violence to get into the Capitol. Some people broke windows. They were screaming. They were protesting. Things that have all happened before. I don't say that everybody on January 6th behaved properly. I think a lot of them ended up properly being in prison. There were some who used violence. 
But that's that is a, because when, it was a riot and not any real threat <clears throat> to the stability of the United States. It's something that's being exaggerated because the thing that Democrats want to do more than anything is to say that Donald Trump is not just somebody with bad policy or bad ideology. He's an unprecedented threat to American democracy and his movement ought to be criminalized. And this what were they there to pro- narrative what were they there is to crucial protest? to that. What were they there Wait, to so protest? Can you specifically respond to the point of that Glenn made about video, the videos? There, it's oh, just bullshit. Might... It's literally I, like I don't know. That's like a guy telling you that you know yesterday I saw UFOs making crop circles. You're you know, an absolute like some... liar, Destiny, but... or you have no idea what you're talking about.